project is about uh, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin micropayments, uh, fudge proxies. Uh, Bitcoin, as you all know, uh, is a digital cryptocurrency which supports transactions. And uh, one of the neat things about Bitcoin is that these transactions can be uh, combined together in interesting ways that can lead to uh, cryptographically enforced contracts. Uh, one such contract that we found useful for our project was the, the Bitcoin micropayment. And uh, first I'm going to go over some some benefits of the Bitcoin micropayment and why they're useful for our uh, implementation. And then I'm going to uh, remind you guys how the, the Bitcoin micropayment uh, protocol works. Good. So uh, first, uh, one of the benefits of the, the micropayment protocol is that it, it limits the trust between the, the parties involved. Um, Either party in, in the Bitcoin micropayment can can only lose uh, one unit of, for us, we've got clients that serve as one unit of payment or one unit of service. Um, another advantage is that the, the protocol can be ended at any time during the payment phase, and it can <coughs> still be resolved where both parties end up uh, getting all of the Bitcoin that they, that they deserve. Now, both of the first two bullet points could be easily taken care of uh, by having a system where you just pay small amounts very often for your service. But what makes the, uh, the micropayment protocol very interesting is that it satisfies this, this third property where you, you're not killed by transaction fees because you, you only end up with two transactions posted in the final blockchain. Um, to, to, re, to remind you how the, uh, the Bitcoin micro microtransactions work, uh, you start in this initialization phase where the, the client creates uh, an escrow transaction. As an input, the client takes coins from their wallet and then they... Uh, they lock the output with a multi-sig that requires both the client signature and the server signature to spend. Now, this is risky for the client to just immediately post this into the blockchain as the server could um, hold the transaction as, as ransom and the, the client wouldn't be able to access the money. So the client, before posting it, creates this secondary transaction, the refund transaction, which takes as input the escrow transaction and returns all of the money that was in the escrow to the client. This transaction is time locked and can only be posted after a certain number of blocks have been mined. The client can hand this to the server, which will sign it because it poses no risk for the server, and then the server will give it back to the client. Once the client has this transaction in their back pocket, they can safely post the escrow transaction to the, uh, to the blockchain. This uh, signifies the transition into phase two, the payment phase of the, uh, the Bitcoin micropayment protocol. During this phase, the, uh, the client uh, continuously produces transactions that uh, pay larger and larger fractions of the escrow to the server and return smaller and smaller fractions of the escrow to themselves. They will sign each of these transactions before they hand them to the server. This will continue for some amount of time uh, until uh, the, the payment ends, which can happen for a variety of reasons. It's because the client contacts the server and is like, hey, you know, I'm done, I'm done paying, let's, uh, let's resolve. This signifies the, uh, the transition to the last phase, the resolution phase of the, uh, of the micropayments. So something that I'd like to point out here, if you exclude this transaction, all of the rest of these transactions are double spends of the same input, which means, as, guarantee, or as promised on the last uh, slide, only two of these transactions can make it into the blockchain. Under typical usage, the server will take the transaction that is heard from the uh, client that pays it the most, and it will sign it and post it into the blockchain. If the server misbehaves, the client can wait until the time lock unlocks on the refund and then post the refund into the blockchain. Either way, once one of these two transactions has made it into the blockchain, the protocol is complete. Uh, now Harry's going to talk about uh, proxies. Hey, so we decided that a really good use of Bitcoin micropayments that would really highlight how, how powerful they were would be, would be to apply them to proxies. And, and proxies really feed into to part of what's so great about Bitcoin, which is anonymity. And so I just want to talk about a little bit of, of kind of the most powerful features that, that we think that our system will help to support. Uh, one cool thing is that prox proxies can help you hide your full browsing session from the server that you're visiting. So not only kind of using a single proxy, you could hide your IP, but your, all your connections still appear to be coming from the same IP. But if you're able to acquire a large pool of proxies, then you can rotate your, transac your, your connections among them. So if we have our local computer you could forward through kind of a local proxy running on your machine, and then it can distribute your connection out onto the internet, which will make it a lot harder to identify all the requests that are coming from a single machine. Uh, one, one great tool you can use proxies for is you can avoid censorship. If you have proxies that are available in a lot of different locations, then chances are you could find somewhere to connect to that you'll be able to avoid any censorship that your country is producing. 
and uh, and then a little more technical note you can in general change your path to the network so if you have a lot of options of where you're connecting through then it's really easy to avoid traveling air traffic traveling through certain countries that you might that might be listening to your traffic or that you might want to avoid for some reason or another um, so now I'd like to talk about why micropayments are, are such a, a good solution to a, a lot of the problems associated with pro with the current uh, market for proxies. So currently there are a few different ways that you can acquire proxies. Either you can use Tor, which is awesome, but one big problem with Tor is that there are just not very many nodes in Tor, and especially exit not too, not and especially exit nodes because there's very little incentive to actually become a, a node on the Tor network other than just being a really good person. But uh, that doesn't really work very well for capitalism. And <laughs> the other option is that you kind of go out and you find there are a bunch of businesses that are willing to, to, be your to supply you with a proxy if you pay them every month, which is kind of a, a weird system to have, especially with proxies. A lot of times you can't really trust that they'll be around for that month after you've paid them. And so you really don't want to enter into that kind of contract. And also, most forms of payment, you have to... Which you certainly wouldn't want to do, since that kind of goes against the whole anonymity thing. And so, at least to to solve the trusting them to stay up issue, you can you can decide, okay, I'm going to pay in much much smaller amounts, and so I'm just going to pay for the next little blob of service, and then I'll pay again once once I use that up, which would which is great. But as uh, Miles was discussing earlier, if you're sending out tons and tons of small transactions, the transactions fees are going to be almost as big as the cost of the transactions themselves, which is really just an unworkable system for payment. And so micro micropayments are, are perfect there, since they allow you to do that continuous feed of payment without any extra cost in terms of fees. And all of this will, will help to provide us with a, a large pool of available proxies that will really increase the benefits that we talked about in the previous slide. And uh, now Paul will give you a little uh, <coughs> talk about how we actually handle discovery in our system. Uh, right, so now that we have our clients in our servers, we need a way for them to find each other. Um, BitTorrent already solved this with their trackers, and we figured we would use, uh, we would just use trackers for ourselves. But we found that uh, unsatisfying, and we realized that really any sort of public database that allows proxies to announce themselves and allows clients to read from that can be used as a discovery service. And in fact, Bit Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain itself uh, serves as a perfect example uh, I'm sorry, as a perfect vehicle for this. Uh, um, so this is kind of the high level overview of what a discovery service would look like. This could, uh, this kind of represents either BitTorrent or Bitcoin. <coughs> um, so in the BitTorrent example, clients and servers have a rendezvous server. Um, so like uh, that would be a tracker and they connect to that and they can, uh, and they can find each other. But each, um, each rendezvous server is independent. So uh, if, if a rendezvous server fails, that leaves all the clients and servers that were connected to that rendezvous server unable to connect to each other. In the Bitcoin example, these red dots are uh, actual connections between the rendezvous servers, because the rendezvous servers are in fact full nodes that each carry uh, the entire blockchain. And so when a server, if a server uh, announces itself on the blockchain to uh, this full node, eventually the blockchain will sync between all the nodes in the network, and a client over here can still read the advertisement from the server. Uh, so this is much more robust. Where a tracker, a BitTorrent tracker, could be blocked or taken down, um, the only, uh, it's, even if uh, a client can only connect to one full node in the Bitcoin network, they can now get the entire blockchain. So we implemented both the BitTorrent tracker uh, version and the Bitcoin version. Um, in the BitTorrent version, the clients and the servers spoof themselves as BitTorrent nodes. So they would go to the tracker and say, hey, I'm looking for this file, which is not actually a file. And the tracker would return all of the other clients and servers uh, in the proxy network. Uh, in the case of Bitcoin, we use the op return, trans uh, the op return uh, operation, which allows you to put 40 bytes uh, into a transaction. And so what we did there is the servers would um, use op return, put 40 bytes, but in, uh, in the first few bytes, it would use a magic number that would um, kind of demark this transaction as being a part of the proxy network so that when clients scan through the blockchain, they'd see that magic number and they would know it's from a server that they're looking for. And so after that, they would read out the next few bytes as an IP address and port. Um, and 
Now to finish up with uh, this part of the presentation, I just want to give you a little more info about how we actually went about implementing uh, all the rest of the system. Uh, so there were two major components of our system. There was that we had our uh, SOX proxy servers, which took care of all of the forwarding of traffic between clients and servers. There was the micropayment, cha the micropayment channels themselves, where the payment act between the clients and the server. So we started out by um, by creating versions of our proxy server, one that would be the client that you could just point your browser to, and then that client would find, uh, through the discovery that Paul discussed, would find servers uh, on the network to, to connect through. We started out just getting that, and then we added in payment channels. So we used Bitcoin J for that, and Bitcoin has has support for micropayment channels in in kind of which is fairly workable so we had to sort through that figured out how to integrate that into our into the servers themselves so that they would then also bitcoin based apps uh the and then uh and so that we could then open a payment channel when connecting to a server and finally we had to correlate between the Sox proxy server channel and the bitcoin payment channel so that when the payments went so that when the payment got th went through, the proxy server then said, okay, we'll receive more traffic. We had to deal with a lot of threading issues since you have to be able to receive payments independently of the server. And so correlating all of that was a big step. And now uh, I think we'd like to show you a little quick demo of our project. There's not a ton to see since most of the cool stuff is happening in the back end since when it works, it means the browser loads. But we're going to show just a... Uh, we can show you a pretty interesting looking uh, council output where it describes what's going on. And that should. So just, just, uh, just to make this clear, um, Harry, Harry's running the, the client proxy, and I'm running the server proxy. And then uh, for, this, for this demo, we're using the, uh, the Bitcoin discovery, and, and Paul is hosting our, our Bitcoin side. Um, so we're just going to Miles is setting the server, go to the client. We're hoping this will all work. Uh, so here you can see we uh, started up the, s the uh, server. Is, let's see, is that big enough? Not really. Um, well, I'll just describe what it's saying. So the SOC server starts. It opens up in a port. It connects to the tracker. It gets a list of peers. It checks. So a lot of times the peers might not be totally working, so it iterates through them and finds which ones are working. So it finds a working server. Then we can go over to Firefox and check out uh, Random Walker. <laughs> and uh, you can see the, uh, the page loads. If we flip back over to the client, you can see we're connecting to the website. Um, I'm going to stop the, uh, the client so I can just uh, scroll up. So this is a combination of we find a server to use, we connect to it. You can see we put amounts in the channel. And each time, so it's a little hard to see, but we add, we, each time we load a new page, we also add an increment to the channel, and the channel then shifts to having more funds senting, sent to the server and less funds re redeemed by us. And then the server then allows us to receive the data. And so now, just to demonstrate that it works, I'm going to comment and out the line in my code where the and demonstrate that um, what's going to happen is the server has a small allowance for receiving, uh, for sending traffic, just so you can check that the server's working. But after one or two page loads, the, um, or actually, well, in this case, actually, after only one, we're going to hit connecting. It's going to try to connect. And since no more payments are going through, it'll fail to connect. And so that's, yeah, that's what happens when you stop paying. <laughs> and uh, that one worked, but the next one will not. Since that's the small allowance for it to work sometimes, but uh, not always. Uh, so yeah, so that's our demo. Hopefully this won't magically load. Maybe it will, but <laughs> it should <laughs> if everything's working properly. Please fail. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, then uh, we can open it up to uh, questions. Yeah, um, so I mean, it's whenever I mean whenever the server it's essentially whenever the 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 server decides that the client stops paying. So if the, the server hasn't received a payment in a while from the client, then it'll cut off. Or if the server for some reason decides it wants to just stop serving this client, 
that it can post it then. So either side can really decide to stop, and, and at some point the server posts the transaction. Or if the server doesn't, then whenever the refund transaction that we talked about at the beginning is no longer locked, that'll get posted. Uh, awesome project. Did you guys um, think at all about how to like stop discovery? Right? Like, so you list yourself on the blockchain. How do you like unlist yourself on the blockchain? Um, oh, we didn't implement that. Okay. So uh, essentially, essentially, you just turn it off. <laughs> like yeah. turn so your so server you just off. Have the query yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, it doesn't work and, and then you could do it yeah. implicitly. Yeah. Well, so I don't. We didn't have a stop, but implicitly, if the same address is uh, advertising a new IP address, I would think clients could infer that they've yeah. moved. But we didn't do stopping. And more often than not, the way the clients work is they go onto the blockchain and they download the most recent block and then the next and then the next until they find the number of proxy the servers issue. that they're interested in. Yeah. So most servers are, would would end up every so often because they want to be found early. Yeah. And so the you're sense. never going to have to look back that far. So if you stop announcing yourself, then you'll stop getting discovered fairly quickly. And the cost for announcing every so often is pretty low because, I mean, you have to pay the transaction have to have some minuscule amount of Bitcoin to make it an actual yeah. transaction, but it goes. Yeah, and so if you're actually like getting paid to be a server, it's not that becomes bad. inconsequential. Yeah. The Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer protocol itself, by the way, doesn't seem to handle undiscovery that well. Um, mm. If you look at the API from, uh, what is it, Bitmail? There's, there, there's an API, I forget the name, that uh, even tries to return you a list of all the active uh, Bitcoin nodes, but it's often like way out of date, and most of them are not looking at Mm -hmm. um, but I actually have a fairly basic question, something uh, never quite understood. It's, uh, it's in the wiki as well, that uh, w w with your motivating slide, that the main reason not to just um, send a bunch of small transactions is the transaction fee. But I would have thought that a bigger problem is that you have to wait 10 minutes or whatever, so the granularity of payment fee is very yeah. limited. Does that, does that make sense? Or? Yeah, yeah okay. that's also a fairly major problem. Yeah, yeah you only have to yeah. wait 10 minutes once, basically, for that first well, but he was saying that, but a problem, uh, this uh, other than the fact, other than the transaction fees, sending many small transactions would also yeah. be a problem just in terms of the waiting period. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's not mentioned in the wiki about microtransactions. No. Or micropayments. No. Hmm. I, I don't think it's as basic. What was the, the actual time increment that you're talking about? Um, is well, it we a actually time increment or no. Like we we so our implementation itself does um, does the payment. Uh, every time there's a request, uh, it, it, you pay per request. Per yeah. request, yeah. Um, in the, like, we had kind of longer term plan to pay per data, okay. which I think makes a lot more sense, and which is kind of one of, so uh, we actually presented this yesterday, uh, similar, similar like, for, the, for our networks class, and one of the questions we received was, couldn't this just be used to uh, do denial of service attacks? Yeah. But you're actually paying for traffic, and so anybody trying to launch a denial of service using the system you would have to, pay. have to pay an enormous amount, yeah. so... Yeah. For all you see, I think, I mean, there is a big commercial market for the proxies in China. Yeah. Uh, I think they're pay for time and not pay for data, but mm. I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Yeah. We, we could shake that market up and throw some yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what originally motivated me in this project was like censorship in China. Yeah. And that's why we had two discovery mechanisms and all that, because it's yeah. easy to block. Anybody else? Uh, cool. All right. Thanks for listening.